Hey guys, and welcome to Anchor to Truth. Today we are diving into part two of chapter 28 of the Book of Jubilees. So let's get started. All right, guys, let's uh, start with verse 11. And Yahuwah opened the womb of Leah, and she conceived and bare Jacob a son. And he called his name Reuben on the 14th day of the ninth month in the first year of the third week. But the womb of Rachel was closed, for Yahuwah saw that Leah was hated and Rachel loved. And again, Jacob went in unto Leah, and she conceived and bare Jacob a second son, and she called his name Simeon on the 21st of the 10th month and in the third year of this week. And again, Jacob went in unto Leah, and she conceived and bare him a third son, and he called his name Levi in the new moon of the first month in the sixth year of this week. And again, Jacob went in unto her, and she conceived and bare him a fourth son, and he called his name Judah. On the fifteenth of the third month, in the first year of the fourth week, and on account of all this, Rachel envied Leah, for she did not bear. And she said to Jacob, "Give me children." And Jacob said, "Have I withheld from thee the fr the fruits of thy womb? Uh, have I forsaken thee?" And when Rachel saw that Leah had borne four sons to Jacob, Reuben and, Reuben and Simeon, and Levi and Judah, she said unto him. Go unto Bila, my handmaid, and she will conceive and bear a son unto me. And she gave him Bila, her handmaid, to wife. And he went into her, unto her, and she conceived and bare him a son, and he called his name Dan on the ninth of the sixth month in the sixth year of the third week. And Jacob went in again unto Bila a second time, and she conceived and bare Jacob another son, and Rachel called his name Naphtali. On the fifth of the seventh month in the second year of the fourth week. And when Leah saw that she had become sterile and did not bear, she envied Rachel and she said, I'm sorry, and she also gave her handmaid Zilpah to Jacob to wife. And she conceived and bare a son, and Leah called his name Gad on the twelfth of the eighth month in the third year of the fourth week. He went in again unto her, and she conceived and bare him a second son. And Leah called his name Asher on the second of the eleventh month in the fifth year of the fourth week. And Jacob went into unto Leah, and she conceived and bare a son, and she called his name Issachar, on the fourth of the fifth month in the fourth year of the fourth week, and she gave him to a nurse. And Jacob went in again unto her, and she conceived and bare two children, a son and a daughter, she called the name of the son Zebulon, and the name of the daughter Dinah. In the seventh of, or in the seventh of the seventh month, in the sixth year, on the fourth week, or of the fourth week, and Yahuwah was gracious to Rachel, and opened her opened her womb, and she conceived and bare a son, and she called his name Joseph, on the new moon of the fourth month, in the sixth year, in this fourth week. Okay, that was a lot of reading, but I think, I think all that went together. I find this really interesting. I kind of want to go in and check something real quick. So I just wanted to real quick go back in here and look at all the the months, um, you know, because obviously it's given us very specific birth dates, right? Um, we're given the 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 months and the weeks and all that stuff, right? So with the the first one was in the ninth, then the tenth, then the first, then the third, uh, then the sixth, then the seventh, and the eighth, then the eleventh, and the fifth. And then we have another one born in the seventh month and then fourth month. So um, we do have a re repeat in the seventh month, but every all the other months are different. I was just I was just wondering if there was any kind of neat little catch to have there, but I hadn't hadn't seen anything yet. So I don't know if anybody's got any details yeah. on, <laughs> on their birthdays or any significance to these individuals. You know, that'd be cool to that'd be cool to know. So. Um, I do think um, I do think it's interesting. We always have this idea of the elder children getting the the the, the eldest boys getting the blessings and all of that stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Yet we know all the prophetic good stuff was coming through Levi and Judah. Uh, yet we have Reuben and Simeon before Levi and Judah. So I just think that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, and also you remember when um, Jacob's giving out the blessings at some point or giving out kind of the blessings <laughs> that, uh, you know, Reuben's kind of, he's, he's punished for something that he did that was bad. Mm -hmm. So that, I think that kind of, in a way, disqualifies him from that role. So that's that's my assumption on that. Yeah. 
So not going into too much detail about all that stuff, but I think that that's, you know, part of it. When you look at Joseph, Joseph was almost the youngest other than Benjamin. Uh, Benjamin, however you want to say it, or Benjamin. Uh, he was almost the youngest, but also out of that group, I think, you know, what how God used him. I mm -hmm. uh, definitely had an anointing and a blessing upon his life. Right. Yeah, and then I think what we see a lot of is, just, you know, there's some different details that we are of course we're going to get here with jubilees then we're going to get with the the traditional canon one we're getting dates and times and and you know we do get the who was born to who and, I, and I mean, of course it's interesting to see that you know jacob here is i'm, I'm all about rachel yet I, I marry leah first and yet leah gets the first four kids before anything even any other options even come in with the handmaids and all that other stuff um, so it is interesting to see that, yes, those official, like Kyle was saying, with Levi and Judah coming through that bloodline of through Leah, that wasn't that wasn't Jacob's plan. And sometimes, you know, when we look at the idea of biblical prophecy and, you know, God's way versus our way, he's like, I have plans. I know what's going on. I know that we're going to need a Levi and a Judah. And I know that those kids are going to come from Leah. The only way this is going to happen is if you marry her first. The only way this is going to happen is if I shut the womb of Rachel. So it's interesting to see that that's how that played out. You know, right there in the beginning of verse 11, it says, and Yahuwah opened the womb of Leah. It wasn't that she was the most, most fertile or she was the most ready. It was, it was God's choice. It was God's design, which it's really interesting to kind of throw that monkey wrench, I guess, if you want to call it that, that, that aspect of it into the story. And I'm sure Jacob's thinking the same thing, like, what's going on here? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, absolutely, man. Yeah, this is what I uh, proudly call the birthing wars, because <laughs> it's like poor Jacob's like, okay, well now I'm now I'm you know sterile, so here take my handmaid. You know, as he's just going back and forth, and next thing you know, he's got more kids. He knows what to do with, but <laughs> <laughs> and then I think there, too, what else we see is like um, with with Leah. I think it was also God teaching Jacob a little a little bit, and I don't want to say that. Jacob was just a terrible human being or anything like that. But it's still early in verse 12. It's talking about how Yeshua saw, or Yahuwah saw that Leah was hated and Rachel was loved. I mean, that that's a detail that's very uncomfortable for a marriage. Like, I'm married to you. Mm -hmm. You're my wife. You're the first wife. You're the number one on the list. And yet somehow you still end up in the category of hated. That's, that's tough. And, you know, it kind of makes you wonder if God's saying, hey, children are a blessing. After these four children... You're going to come around a little bit, Jacob. You're going to wise up. You're going to say, yes, your super pretty wife, the one that you really, really wanted, the apple of your eye, the dream scenario. Yeah, I still, I still allowed you to have that. But this is how family works. This is how dynamics work. When, when Joe, Jonathan, Kyle, and the rest of you guys read this someday in the future, mm -hmm. it's important to see that God loves everybody, that God treats marriage the same across the board. There's not a, you can marry four women and you just keep the one you like, or, you know, it, that's not how that works. That's not part of the plan. It's not part of the goal or the expectation in, in that relationship. So, uh, you know, Jacob had to do some maturing along the way as well. I mean, he's still talking about, I hate you after, and I mean, and I'm sure it's not like the hate we think of today. It's a displeased with, or, you know, I'd rather neglect you to give her more time, you know, like that, like Joe said, kind of the wars a little bit, but yet we're not going to see that be the case later, you know, and it's just part of that beginning steps in the right direction. It's almost like God's like, I know better and you don't. Yeah, I agree with that, Jonathan. I was going to make the same comment that the translation, whatever that was from into English, I don't think this means hate it. Like, I hate your guts. I don't ever want to see you be from me. I right. mean, right. I think this is probably the best way that they translate this, but I don't think it's the same as what we consider hate today. Mm. Um, I, I agree with you on that one. And, you know, we talk about the womb being open, you know, multiple times throughout the scriptures when you're reading, um, people really did account it as a blessing from the father to have children right. and that <clears throat> a lot of times if a woman back then wasn't having a child, they would be looked at saying, are you, you know, are you cursed? Is there something going on in your life? Because, right. you know, maybe that's why God is not blessing you with children or something like that. But you see here, and I, and I agree with what you're saying, Jonathan, is that the father's like, you know what, maybe I'll teach Jacob a little bit of humility here. And so the wife that he does favor uh, because here's the deal: if, if all of a sudden she's all producing, that he's he's probably going to her more than the other. Mm -hmm. 
And so it's like, you know what? Uh, we're gonna we're gonna even it out here a little bit. Um, the father, the father having compassion here, seeing the circumstances. Look, it ain't the best circumstances for everybody. I mean, just think about it. It's like you're being taken advantage of by your by your uh, your father in law. You just left the situation back home where your brother wants to kill you. I mean, life ain't looking all like ro sun, you know, rosy and sunshine and, and all that stuff. And now you're in a situation, and when you get there, you're like, finally, <laughs> I've waited all these years. I'm a 60-year-old virgin. I'm going to have my wife. She's beautiful. And I wake up with the other woman, record scratch, the whole nine yards. Of, whoa, 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 what happened? And so it isn't the best of circumstances. But again, and, I, and I'll, I'm going to say this often, is that God's having to work through us. We're the mess. God's not. God's like, hey, I got a perfect plan, and I got the right thing that's going to happen. But I've got to work through you guys, and I've got to work through your imperfection, your flaws, all this stuff. But guess what? That plan is going to work out. <laughs> we're going to get there. It may not look pretty, but we're going to get there. Yeah. Yeah, I I agree. I don't I don't think I need to add too much to that, but I do agree. I don't think that this was hated in the in the you know right right in the in the way that we think of hated. Um, and if that was the case, then I don't think that we've been having sex with her in the first place if that was truly the case you know what i mean so yeah i was, yeah, saying, I think, I was thinking the same thing but i'm glad you said it okay. <laughs> <laughs> i don't i don't think he would have had relations with her relations. Okay. there you go there Let's clean up for the kitties <laughs> yeah so yeah and, and i do find that very interesting but the womb of rachel was closed for you who saw that leah was hated and rachel loved so yeah the father is doing this because of mm. his because of um jacob's um treating one better than the other let's put it like that right right so you very know, interesting next, yep the next part cal in uh, 16 um where it says and on account of all of this it says rachel envied leah where she did not bear and she said to jacob so this is i'm upset and it's all your fault <laughs> if you've been married more than five minutes men <laughs> <laughs> You know that at some point in your life, your wife, out of just anger, really not at you, but just she has to unload on somebody, will say, it's all your fault. You did this. And so no uh, Leah, what's he had that right? <laughs> so Leah, in her frustration, she's looking at Jacob like, this is your fault. You know, she's like, and she said to Jacob, give me children. What's wrong with you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Jacob said, have I withheld from thee the fruits uh, of thy womb? He says, "Have I forsaken thee? Have I done this to you? Really? Is it me? Do I? Is it? Do I have the ability to make this happen? Right? You know, um, like Kyle said, we, the relations is probably there, but just mm. nothing. No fruits coming forth from that. Right. And Jacob's like, it's not me, <laughs> you know. Um, and then I know in the when we read the Genesis account that it's, you know, he I believe he explains to her, this is this is the father. This isn't me." Mm -hmm. So I understand your frustration. I understand you're 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 wanting the you know to have conceive a child, but this is out of my hands. I can't do anything about it. I do want to point out too on this um, on the side over here. It says uh, the twelve sons of uh, the twelve sons of Jacob appear in our text in the same order as in Genesis twenty nine verses thirty two through thirty four, and also thirty verses one through twenty four. And it appears 35, 17 through 18. So Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, uh, Asher, Issachar, Zebulun, Joseph, Benjamin. Then it says a different order is given in Genesis 49 and in the Testament of the 12 patriarchs, hmm. which I find that interesting. Yep. You know, so. it kind of makes you wonder if there's something in their in their life they're a personal story that got, you know, like this is Genesis 49 is way later down the road. The 12 patriarchs is they're on their deathbed, you know, so something in their, in their life, something about the story as it unfolded kind of said, you know what, we're going to shift the the primary. We're going to shift the order a little bit. Not so much that anybody did anything wrong or anything, did anything right. It's just, Hey, at this time we're getting closer to the end. Things are a little bit different than the way we started. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yep, and uh, Kyle, if you continue reading down there on the far left also, it says, continued, it says, the order of birth as given in Jubilees is complicated by textual difficulties, and it says, see Charles. So, 
Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that maybe within the translate, what he means by when this was translated, I'm assuming that's what he means by that. The, the textual difficulties in it, maybe, and maybe it was just what they were, it was being originally copied from, or, or it wasn't as clear mm-hmm. you think possibly, or you think there's something else. I don't know. There's tons of options. There's, there's mm-hmm. like, like I said, translation errors, there's clerical errors, there's fragments, you know, what, what version of Jubilees was available at the time of the translation. Yeah. So, you know, especially with the Dead Sea Scrolls and and the way, the way they're fragmented and the preservation, we're lucky to have what we do have. But it's yeah, not perfect, absolutely, so. yeah, I agree with that. People need to remember that we got the, the things that we're reading today are thousands of years old, translated from uh, you know, uh, copied from other copies of copies of copies. You're never going to find the original copy because it's probably disintegrated. It's, <laughs> you know, at some point, that's why they always had to have scribes and people who were constantly writing the Torah writing the books of the Bible and different things like that, knowing that, you know, these things weren't meant to physically last forever. Right. So this is, um, you know, in, in this Jubilee period that all these children are being born, uh, this one actually does give us, you know, the first year of the fourth week. So, um, you know, and, and specifics like that. So I would, uh, I'd really like to look into that and just kind of see, where that all plays out. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm yeah. sure it, it'll go, it'll go through great links to validate a lot of the stories that we go back and read of, you know, then Judah and Tamar and all these other stories. You're like, Oh, okay. Well, if he was born at this time, this is happening at this point in history. Mm-hmm. We're going to have a lot more validity behind what Genesis is saying. Cause now we have date markers. We have times, we have ages. Well, you know, this happened in the fourth month of the, of whatever. And you're like, Oh, but he was 32 or wow. He was mm-hmm. only 17. Oh boy. That changes yeah. the dynamics a little bit, you know? Yep. So yep. what what does the marker guys mean in verse fifteen when it says the first year of the fourth week and it's got the marker there, it kind of looks like a cross? What is that saying there? Is that something? Is that saying it was kind of added in, or they had to guess that, or I'm not sure. I don't remember what that symbol means because I don't. I think it's simply. It. I'm like, looking through here now. I don't. I, don't, I think sorry, it's simply. Ahead. I think it's simply saying that that. The, the the parts with the little crosses on it is a reference to the information that's off to the side. Mm-hmm. Okay, because we have it again in verse 24. Right. And then if you look over there off to oh, the side. Okay. The little dates. Uh, in verse, verse 26 has it also. I mean, I know we hadn't gotten there yet, but if you look at verse 26, you'll see that. And uh, it oh, says, okay. Terry with me for thy wages and whatever. Over here it references Genesis 30, 28. Um, yeah. Okay. So, it's in there a so, bunch. Yeah. It's at the, the end of eighteen. It's at the end of fifteen. It's uh, it's in there quite a few times. I think Kyle, you that, that's definitely an option. It's those little date markers over there to the right. Yeah, I, yeah. I think okay. it, I think it's just saying you know, hey, consider this. Consider this information that's off to the side when looking at this. Yeah. Gotcha. Yep. Yeah, I agree with you. It might be the time where the timestamps are because. It's that one in uh, verse 15 is literally right across from it. It says 20, 21, 28 a.m. Okay. Cool. Yeah. okay. It's a it's an author's choice on that one for sure. Because it's not a parenthetical uh, insertion. It's just a highlight of what's already there. So gotcha. it's interesting okay. why, why, they, why he chose it at all. But uh, So what do you guys think about the the handmaids? You know, obviously that's the, the wives, the Rachel and Leah's choice. Um, and that matter wasn't like Jacob was out here, you know, seeing how many wives he could accumulate, but it was more of a, Hey, you know, this is what we're doing. We're blessed. We're, we're part of Laban's farm. We're getting, we're really, mm-hmm. I'm starting to make a name for ourselves. Uh, it, it's their choice and their desire to say, I, I would rather have children under our umbrella, the Rachel umbrella than to not have children at all. So this is the option that I'd rather you take. And that's very much so at the woman's discretion. Um, it seems like that's a little bit of a different story than the way we see it sometimes in, you know, modern world uh, scenarios that try to emulate these stories. Yeah. I mean, when we see this example played out though, at the very beginning with Abraham and Sarah, you know, Sarah does the same thing where she says, well, apparently I'm not going to, you know, this isn't going to happen. I'm very up in age. And so in their minds, they're thinking, well, this is the only way this is going to happen. Mm. And so you see that as a, a cultural thing, I believe that like you're kind of what you're saying there, it's like, Hey, we want to keep this in the family. And 
you know, loosely based. And we said this last time that the, the two handmaidens, they're, they're twin, twin sisters. Um, and that the, they could have actually been half sisters to Rachel and Leah. So technically it's all in the family. This is an outside, you know, DNA or outside blood and all this stuff. So it's staying all within the family. And another consideration that I'd like to uh, kind of bring to the table is, you know, obviously it's the wives choosing to bring in um, the handmaidens, but it seems like the wives are still, the original two ladies are still like very much a part of the whole process. They're naming the child They're, You mm. know, do you guys think that they're raising the kid? Like the, I'm not, I'm not trying to go as far as to say surrogacy. It's not to that extreme for sure, but it's almost like, Hey, you, uh, the handmaidens here, marry her. You know, like I think Jacob made the right choice. He's not like, I'm just going to have babies by this lady. I'm going to marry her. She's going to be a part of the family. I'm going to take care of her. She's going to be fully invested in the situation. But at the same time, it seems like the original two married wives are the ones who are naming the kids. The original mm -hmm. two wives are the ones that are almost seeming like they're still in some form, like in like a higher leadership position. I don't, I don't yeah. like a hierarchy. I don't know. Do you guys read that yeah. into that? Or is that something that yeah. you're considering? Yeah, I, I would agree with that, Jonathan. It was just a hierarchy thing. It's like, hey, I'm the wife. Now, it does say, um, and, and it may, may be just a, a, a terminology, but it does give the implication that uh, when she, when Rachel gives Zilpa to Jacob in verse 20, it says, and Zilpa, and, and I say, I'm sorry, Rachel, she also gave her handmaid Zilpa to Jacob to wife. Mm -hmm. So it's like they are technically now, you know, the wife right as well but i think there is a hierarchy there as far as we're the wives and you're the secondary wife i don't know how they would play that out <laughs> but anyway kind of seems that way you know what i mean yeah that, that's why i was trying i was reading it into that but it it's like the two words almost are contradictory it's like your wife which means you get full status but then you're still like secondary somehow but maybe that's yeah. just the way we're reading it and maybe it's just giving us like the pri you know the original story was it was these two women from laban uh, so we don't want to ever diminish that Jacob chose, well, sort of kind of chose these two women versus the other two being given more as uh, an acceptable wife to continue the family story. Right. Well, I mean, I, I do think that uh, that Rachel and Leah both giving their handmaidens was to um, gain favor in the eyes of Jacob. Because yes. of their situation, right? One one being that she wasn't conceiving and the other being that she was done being able to conceive, right? So this was trying to keep favor in Jacob's eyes. But I mean, we got to take into consideration also. I mean, these women were 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 also elevated to a, a new position, right? right. They're they're mm -hmm. they're not just the lowly servant girls anymore, right? They're they are they are a wife to Jacob now. Um, mm -hmm. so I, I don't, I don't know when it comes to the, the status thing, or excuse me, when it comes to the, 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 the hierarchy type thing, I mean, maybe that was a thing culturally, maybe that was something that was agreed upon when giving them. Um, but I also don't think that this was a matter of like, okay, this is my servant. Um, I'm going to give her to you to wife as this was, as if this was some kind of transaction, right? right. Like. I, I also, I mean, I don't see it in the text, but I would, I don't think that this would have been an issue or been a, a, a type of thing where it was a, a, a literal giving of a person. This would have been a, you know, Hey, how would you like to be Jacob's wife? Right. Go, go to them and say, you know, yes, I would like to do that. That would be wonderful. Okay, cool. Let me go talk to Jacob kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Instead of a, just a transaction of literally giving a woman. All right. Um, so that's just my thought. Yeah. Yeah. I said the only reason why it was just a, a little bit of a, a thought process, just because of the naming. But like you said, maybe be, that was a part of their conversation. Hey, you're going to, you're going to jump up there on the rungs a few, a few steps, but I'm going to name the kids. That's kind of, that's my thing. You know, like I, I felt like that's what God told me to do. So yeah, it's interesting that just to see that, well, if you're the wife, you should be making decisions over your own kids. And you're like, well, no, Le Leah named them and Rachel named them. So it, it's just a, it's interesting. You know, it's like, it'd be interesting to go back and be a fly on the wall during some of these stories. You know, we get, we get the super base level story. We don't get the Jacob and Rachel and Leah having these side conversations around the fire at night of, mm -hmm. well, I mean, we've been trying, it's been, you know, three years and, you know, 
God promised us sands of the sea and Abraham told me and your mom told what, what's going on. What should we do? Mm -hmm. uh, let's go to extreme measures, I guess. Let's bring in another one, you know, and, and, it, and again, it, I, again, I don't think, you know, I definitely never want to diminish the role of the women or, or that they are any less than in the story. They're definitely being super elevated and they, we remember their names for a reason. They're written down for a reason, not because they right. were just, you know, after effects and just, uh, well, you did your job and I get out of the way. You know, they were, they were a part of the whole story the whole time. Uh, one more question here. So it was Zebulun and Dinah. Were they twins? Yes. That's what it, that's what it sounds like to me. Yeah, it, it doesn't use the words twins, but it says it bore, bore two children. So it's almost like. Well, she conceived means one time. Right. And then she bare two children. I will say this. I would say they are twins only because it seems like twins are running through this whole family line. <laughs> You know, eventually down the road, we find out here and there that there there's more sets of twins than I think that we realize. And and they even, have even we've even heard of Cain and Abel. Uh, I've heard that that they were twins. There's a you know a strong speculation there that they were twins. So, so yeah, I'm with Joe on that. I I, I think the 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 way it's worded here, and she and she conceived once and bare two children, um, and then down below it says in the seventh month of uh, the yeah. seventh. In the seventh of the seventh month, in the sixth week, the sixth year of the fourth week. So we're giving one time frame right. on, on this happening as well. So yes, I do think they were twins. And I, I thought that was interesting because that's something I've I've never considered. I've never put that in you know in, in any any part of my theological scriptural walk. I've never been like, oh yeah, Dinah and Zebulun, twins. It's never even <laughs> been an option, you know. So it's 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 great to read this and to maybe get some more to the story. And you know, as we're going to read later, you know, things that happened with Dinah. What happens to Zebulun? What did he say? What did what did he have to say about the situation? Was he more invested than the others? You know, we, we get we'll, we'll have some more meat to the bone when we're reading through some of these stories now, and I and I love that that, that Jubilees has given us those facts. Yep. And uh, I just wanted to say this one last thing right here on this one is that I love the fact that it says in verse twenty four and it says Yahua was gracious to Rachel and, she, and opened her womb and she conceived and bare a son and call and she called his name Yosef or Joseph or little Joey uh, little Joey huh? <laughs> little blessing huh? on the new moon of the fourth month in the sixth year in in this fourth week so here's you know it's an awesome picture here God's like hey I'm gonna close your womb but this isn't permanent this isn't a punishment necessarily. This is just, I need to work some things out here. And so I think that when the father saw how broken Rachel's heart was, he's like, you know what? Now, let me, let me bless you, mm -hmm. you know? And then we know, of course, she's going to have another child. She's going to have Benjamin uh, later, but what a blessing he was, you know, not only to her, but, but would, would, would be known the known world at the time when he was, you know, he was growing up what a blessing he would be to many, many people later down the road. So, yeah. And by the way, guys, sorry about the, uh, if the audio sounds a little funny, we've got, uh, Joe's got a pretty severe thunderstorm going on over there at his house. Thank God we haven't lost power yet. Yeah. Not so long ago, you can see lightning flashing in my back window. So yeah, same story here. <laughs> yeah. We got, we got some good thunder cells uh, coming through South Carolina right now. All right, well, let's get into 25. Let's do it. All right, 25, it says, And in the days when Joseph was born, Jacob said to Laban, Give me my wives and sons, and let me go to my father Isaac, and let me make an, an house, for I have completed the years in which I have served thee for thy two daughters, and I will go to the house of, of my father. And Laban said to Jacob, Tear with me for the wages, and pasture my flock uh, for me again, and take thy wages. And they agreed with one another that he should give him as his wages those of the lambs and kids which were born black and spotted and white, and these were to be his wages. And all and all the sheep brought forth spotted and speckled and black, uh, variously marked, and they brought forth again lambs like themselves, and all that were spotted were Jacob's, and those which were not were Laban's. And Jacob's possessions multiplied exceedingly, and he possessed oxen and sheep and asses and camels and men servants and maid servants. And Laban and his sons envied Jacob, and Laban took back 
his sheep from him and observed him with an evil intent. Mm. Mm. What could ever go wrong with an evil intent? <laughs> yeah, no, right. <laughs> All right. Cue the ominous music. Okay, so I guess I'd like to hear from y'all first on this. What 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 what's going on here, boys? I was being taken advantage of for one. <laughs> you know, I, here's the deal. Laban is an opportunist. And so Absolutely. he's saying, hey, um, when you're here, man, things are happening. They're clicking. I mean, I got more grandkids than ever. Every, life was good. We are blessed. And I think he realizes if Jacob leaves, there goes the blessing. Mm. There goes the money wagon. There goes the whatever you want to call it. And so, but unfortunately what we're seeing, and we'll get to that, I'm sure more here in a second, that Laban's going to turn around and say, oh, I'll make a deal. We'll strike hands. We'll do the, the hand drive, all that stuff. I'm with you. Yeah. Oh, the spotted and, and the speckled and whatever else. Um, that's all yours. Yeah. You can keep that. And probably because what the herd was producing of that was very little. Yeah. So Laban's probably thinking, that's a no brainer. Oh, you want the spotted and the speckled? <laughs> We got what four over there? Yeah, the rest of the flock is you know whatever. Yeah, right. yeah, that, yeah, that's the deal. <laughs> and all of a sudden, it's like, man, <laughs> bad investment, right? No, what you got, John? To, to your point, though, you know, it's when we we're looking at you know starting in twenty five. There, it says, in the days of Joseph was born, Jacob said to Laban. So he, J Jacob was laying the law here. He said, hey, give me my wives and my sons, and let yep. me go to my father. That, that's a very normal request. There wasn't anything that he said there that was, you know, out right. of the ordinary, out of the norm. He wasn't being a bully or a jerk or anything. He was just saying, hey, I've earned these things. I've worked for them. They're they're rightfully there were there was covenants made for seven years and all all the things he's like, I did everything you asked me to do. And what I love about the even these small little verses like this, it really gives us a, a eyeball into the culture. Then Joseph was looking at Laban and saying, hey, give me. He didn't say this is already mine. I do what I want. He said, hey, I'm still under your house. I'm still under your leadership. I'm still under your responsibility in, in a sense. You know, you're still the head guy here. So I need you to bless and give me these things. I can't just go and take these things. That would be me in error. And, you know, Jacob trying to be a righteous, you know, it's, it's, it's just a part of that story that I guess, you know, it's hard to consider sometimes. It's he's a grown man, got multiple wives, mm -hmm. multiple kids, got all his stuff. And he's still asking permission like a child. But when we, we think of that today as in, oh, you're 18, you do what you want. But in reality, yeah. the culture then was way different and way more family oriented. If you were, if, this is family. Laban's a, a yeah. uncle, cousin, you know, these are, these are people that they knew. And it's unfortunate that family's taking advantage of family, but that's a principle we still deal with today. You know, you always hear that phrase going around, never do business with family. You know, you're, you're too close. It's easy to get taken advantage of. It's easy to kind of pull the heartstrings. Man, I'm your brother. How are you going to do me like that? And it's like, no, no this is business. We, 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 we signed a contract. This is you get 50%. I get 50%. You didn't meet your obligation. I'm out of here. Um, so it's just really interesting to see that, that cultural aspect here where J uh, Jacob's not saying, let me leave and go be my own person. He said, let me leave and go back to my father. Let me go back and get mm -hmm. back with family. Let me go back and kind of set things straight. He had to leave under uncomfortable circumstances. I, I left because my brother was trying to kill me, not because things were bad at home. I love my mom and dad. I want to go back and build my house on top of dad's house so we can take care of mom and dad so I can start to build my family around their family so my kids mm -hmm. can see their grandparents. You know, we, we kind of miss out on all those details. And so Jacob's really showing himself to be a family man. And he's like, hey, you're in charge, Mr. Laban. Let me head out. Give me permission. Give me my leave. And I'm going to go. I'm going to go back to my family. I'm going to try to set this the family course back on the right path. So I'm going to go back and build my house with dad. I'm going to go back and take care of family. I'm going to go back and establish the name of, you know, they didn't have last names back then, I guess. But Jacob, <laughs> last name guy. Right. You know, so it's just it's really interesting. I love this little interaction here where he didn't have to say any of that stuff. And Joe, to your point, too, with the sheep. I love that. I, I've always treated it like. Oh, the prized sheep are the the clean spotted ones. Oh, this one's all black. This one's all white. You know, they're perfect. And even if you look at sacrifice wise, you know, you do want to bring a perfect sheep. Mm -hmm. So he's like, I'll take the spotted ones. I'll take the ones that are all mixed together. That's what spotted mm -hmm. generally means is you got all mixed up with all the different colors and shapes and sizes. Generally, they're less desirable. And Jacob's like, but guess what? God's on my side. The less desirable will be the de will be the multiplied. The less desirable will be the ones that end up making the, the fame and fortunes. 
And so yep. that's a, even then there's a little indication of like the human story, right? It's not always the perfect, the beautiful, the awesome that win the story. It's the guys, the girls, the us's. Yep. And I, I, I was looking that up. Um, I'm sure you noticed me with my head down here for a minute. I was digging in on my phone, but you were, you were cheating. Uh, yeah. So the, <laughs> yeah. um, obviously the plain, you know, white sheep is the norm, right? That's the right. normal thing that there is. The, it is a recessive gene that does the spotting and all that stuff. So it is extremely rare comparatively um, mm. that, that it pops up even with spotted sheep producing it's a recessive gene and not a dominant gene. So it doesn't always mean that a spotted sheep is going to produce a spotted sheep. Mm -hmm. So um, it's, it's just kind of interesting. Yeah. How that, how that worked out. Um, <laughs> God knows what he's doing, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, you're going to, you're going to do this. Okay. You want, you want to act funny to my yeah. guy. Okay, cool. Cool. We got you. <laughs> yep. So, yeah. But, very, but unfortunately, uh, uncle wasn't playing fair enough. <laughs> Right. You know, that, that's the sad part of it. Cause again, Jonathan, like you're saying, you know, it's always encouraged not to work with family a lot of times because things happen. Mm -hmm. People get taken advantage of things, you know, things that you agreed upon, whether it was a handshake or on a contract now, all of a sudden seem void and null, you know, it's like, Oh, did I say that? Did I say speckled? You get to keep, no, no, that was mine. I get to keep the speckled, you know, right. <laughs> but you know, we read the Genesis account as what's interesting is how he got there. And I think it was with a popular branch and yeah, the, when they were looking at something while they were drinking water and all this stuff. So I don't know what kind of that is <laughs> exactly, <laughs> but I guess they knew something, you know, Jacob knew enough to know, Oh, if I do this, then it's going to produce this. And uh, so, yeah, what do you guys think about that? Yeah, I think he was very wise when it comes to animal husbandry. I think yeah. he probably said, okay, deal, you know? <laughs> that's that, that's what I'm saying. Okay. <laughs> yeah, well, well, I know I'm going to make this happen. <laughs> well, exactly. And, and when you look at it, you know, it's like it almost seems like Laban, since Jacob was there, removed himself from the day-to-day -day business. He was just enjoying the riches of all the efforts that Jacob was putting in. And, mm -hmm. you know, by the end it said Jacob had many manservants and maidservants. So now Jacob's starting to amass himself a little, I don't want to call it a kingdom, but you know, a, a little unit. And it seems like Laban's distancing himself further and further from the actual hands-on work, the actual involvement in the company. And, and, and how often do we see that in today's world where, you know, the older guy gets a little bit old and he's out of touch and out of date with what's going on. And the younger mm -hmm. guys are kind of coming in and taking over. And instead of the older guys, you know, hey, man, you guys are awesome. Teach me what you're doing. Let me get let, let me get back involved. Let me reinvest in my own product. It's right. You, you guys handle it. Let me just take the proceeds off the top. Well, Mr. Laban here had no idea what was going on, apparently, and is just making all kind of deals willy nilly thinking, oh, yeah, 30 years ago when you first showed up, 15 years ago when you first showed up, man, the there was nothing but white sheep and black sheep. Sure. Take the spotted ones and not paying attention to, oh, there's something else going on here. I haven't raised a sheep in forever you know i almost kind of get that feeling from laban a little bit of he was kind of high on his own supply a little bit you know he was up on the ivory tower and not really messing around he's oh work a little bit more tarry with me for another year why don't you just bring daddy a little more money and see how that plays out you know what i mean right 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 mm -hmm. and then if it doesn't work out i'm just going to double cross you but also yes. sorry one more thing i wanted to bring up yeah. is you know, later we talk about him and divination and his little idol situation. So I wonder too, is there a whole nother like layer peeled back from this whole story we're reading? And Laban's like, oh yeah, I'm technically a bad guy. I'm I'm relying on some bad juju to even get to this place. And I'm not really in your camp at all. As long as you're working for me, I mean, that's Satan's mate, number one goal. You work for me as long as it benefits me. You can stay around as soon as you don't benefit anymore me anymore. You're out of here. I don't. I have no use for you. You can go do whatever you want. I'm. I'm out. You know. So I always kind of try to keep that in the back of my mind that there is a little bit of a dark side to Laban that kind of shows its face a little bit as we, uh, you know, continue reading his story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the thing I want to touch on too, just a little bit more. We talked about a few minutes ago because in verse 25, Kyle, will be bringing it up for me. When it's, when it's talking about this, it made me think about So I went back to the Genesis account on this, but it says, In the days 
In the days when Joseph was born, Jacob said to Laban, Give me my wives and sons. So what's implying here is that they're still under technically the ownership of Laban. They're not truly Jacob's to have to leave and do as he pleases. It says, and let me go to my father Isaac and let me make me a house. Hmm. You know, he's like, hey, I, I need to leave. You know, the Bible talks about when a, when a husband and wife come together, that they become one. And as a husband leaves his house, hmm. you know, and goes, you know, and all that good stuff. So when we go to the Genesis account in Genesis 31, 20, uh, we'll start in verse 22. And it says, and this is after Jacob's already taken off. Okay. And it says on the third day, so Laban's chasing after him. So on the third day, Laban was told, or I'm sorry, let me back it up. He, he hasn't been chasing him yet. He's told. So Jacob's been gone for three days. So I don't know how their camp is set up or how far apart they are, but Laban didn't realize until someone told him, hey, by the way, your son-in-law's done split town. <laughs> He's rolled out with, I mean, everybody's gone. The only thing that was left was a few pots and pans and, you know, maybe a can of soup. That was it. They rolled out. Okay. So in Genesis 22, third, verse 30, oh, I'm sorry, chapter 31, verse 22 says, on the third day, Laban was told that Jacob had run away. He took his relatives with him and went after Jacob. Seven days later, he caught up with him in the hill country of Gilead. Then God, then God came to Laban, the Armenian, in a dream at night and said to him, be careful, do not say anything to Jacob, whether it is good or bad. And it says, and Jacob had set up his tent in the hill country of Gilead. There, uh, That's where Laban uh, caught up with him, and Laban and his relatives camped there too. Laban said to Jacob, what have you done? You have tricked me. You have taken my daughters away like prisoners of war. Why did you run away in secret and trick me? Why didn't you? T why didn't you tell me that I could have sent you away happily? Now, I mean, also, that ain't Laban. Laban's Laban's giving you like, oh, it's all your fault. You know, yeah. if you just would have been nicer, if you just would have told me, I would give you this big party, this big send off, <laughs> and everything else. Yeah. You know what, Laban? I see what you're selling, but I ain't buying it, brother. <laughs> <laughs> Jacob already knew you're never going to let me go. Right. As long as I'm being blessed by my heavenly father, you're going you basically, this is the agreement of greed now that you're never going to let me go. It says, you have taken my daughters away like prisoners of war. Why did you run away? Okay. We got that part that says, then I could have sent you away happily. We could have sung to the music of tambourines and harps. <laughs> He's really trying to sell this thing. It says you didn't even let me kiss my grandchildren and my, and my daughters. Goodbye. You have done a foolish thing. I have the power to harm you. But last night, the God of your father, and this, yeah, this is another thing. He's quoting scripture basically earlier in this chapter, but now he's saying your God, not our God. He's not saying, hey, right. our God showed up. He's saying your God of your ancestors showed up. He says, um, I have the power to harm you, but last night the God of your father spoke to me. He said, be careful. Do not say anything to Jacob, whether it's good or bad. Now you have run away. You long to go back to your father's home, but why did you have to steal the statue of my gods? So that goes into the whole, so we won't go any further than that, but it goes, in, if you've, I'm not sure a lot of you guys out there have read this uh, story before, but we see, I think what we're getting here between the two accounts between Genesis and Jubilees is we're seeing the true heart of Laban here. It really is about greed. It's about what I can get out of this situation. It's all about him. You know, and it's funny, again, we were reading earlier about him quoting, oh, you know, according to the scripture, what's written, oh, by the way, you know, hand to the sky, it's written on the heavenly tables that, you know, the the young, the young, oldest goes first and then the youngest, blah, blah, blah. So he's, but again, this is that trickery where he knows of Abraham, he knows of Isaac, he knows of this God that they serve. So what better way to control someone is all of a sudden throw some scripture at them and then make them feel guilty about it. And so that's why I'm saying here, it's like just reading this, it's like, so there has to be something. And again, I don't understand the culture completely, but there has to be something here that Jacob literally has to run away because there is, there must be some type of ownership still with him and, the, and his daughters and all the children. What do you guys think about that? 
Well, no, we read like in the somewhere. I don't have the reference exactly off the top of my head, but somewhere in, in, in our scriptures, it talks about the, you know, the all, you know, getting in the ear. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's, it's your you're mandated to be slavery or you're volunteer to be in, to be in slavery and slavery not in the modern terms that we think of it today it's you know a bond servant right, or worker. right but when we look at it from that perspective jacob volunteered to be a servant jacob volunteered to stay so he said you know when you when you read that later and you kind of understand what that meant it says hey i'm going to be a part of your family now i'm going to submit to you essentially as a permanent worker it isn't you know we don't once you get the all in your ear you don't un get the thing in your ear you know what i mean so it's uh, interesting to see because i was trying to look at it from that perspective maybe jacob did kind of sign himself up for a life of servitude a life of i'm i'm now a part of your family i volunteer to be here to stay here to remain here um my contract was only to, to obtain the wife my contract wasn't to leave it was just i'll work seven years for rachel i'll work seven years for Leah. After that, there was no more agreements, it seems like, other than these, you know, later on ones that kind of show up about the sheep and the Terry with me for one more year or whatever. You know, it's almost like Jacob was putting in his two-week notice. Hey, I'm ready to get my stuff and head out. He's like, mm -hmm. no, not so much. We, we still got a project for you. Uh, and uh, that project probably would have never ended. But because of that concept of the the all in the ear and, and, and that servitude, I just wonder if that played a factor at all either, because Laban, like you said, was quoting scripture. He, he apparently knows. He's like, hey, you volunteered to stay here. You're you're mine. You know, and, and it's not a I think Laban yeah. was doing it completely wrong. You're not supposed to take ownership of another human. You're right. supposed to say, hey, right. now you're a part of the family. We work together. We're, we're in business together. I'm still the head, but you're you're not a less than human. Where I think Laban was taking it and Jacob, you're now less than you have to do what I say. You're under my control. I think, you know, that ivory tower power goes to your head kind of thing happened here. <laughs> Um, but that's just an opinion that I, I was considering when reading this. Yeah, I, I like the uh, the kind of the the workplace analogy that you give there. I, I think that that's kind of spot on as far as like the two weeks notice kind of thing. Um, I, I do think that there was probably a lot of Laban coming in. I, th I think why Jacob was willing to do it is not only, you know, yeah, I want to help out his father-in-law, but I think he saw, okay, if I leave now, you know, he's not prepared to take all this back on. Mm -hmm. Right. Cause I've been running things for the last 14 plus years. Right. So yeah, we'll, we'll give you a little bit more time to get your stuff together so that when I leave, you're prepared to handle everything. Um, so I, I don't know. And I think Laban obviously was just taking advantage as, as much advantage of that as possible and had no intentions of having someone else run it. Mm -hmm. Right. He, he knew the blessings that was there with, with Jacob being there. So, and, and it's, um, it's kind of one of those things where you get your cake and you get, you get your cake and you get to eat it too. Right. So he got to do all of his servitude of his other gods and all the stuff that come with that. And I would mm -hmm. assume probably not some good stuff, right. Probably. <laughs> so he got to have that kind of lifestyle and have all the blessings and the stuff come in because Jacob was there. Right. So, you know, likely all that. that, that yeah. Nobody wants to give that up. So yeah. Just a thought. Yeah. And Joe, to your earlier point, you know, you were reading through the story in Genesis mm -hmm. there and yeah, he's, he's selling it. Oh uh, man, we're going to throw a party. We're going to have the tambourines. We're going to get freshly, still stinky shofars you know like this is going to be <laughs> awesome this is this is what the whole tigger tape parade <laughs> <laughs> we're going to throw hay in the sky and everything but you know we we i'm glad that we get verse 30 you know at the very end there he says and he observed him with evil intent there there was no positivity at the end of that story there was a like, oh yeah, yeah i'm gonna throw you a party sure whatever dude like i had evil in my brain like my thought process wasn't good i i, I never intended for this to be an awesome scenario for you it was supposed to be awesome for me and you're taking away the awesome for me and then so what does he get he gets retaliatory i'm, I'm gonna chase you down well of course he caught him jacob's leaving with women children animals like yeah he's moves moving regular people speed he's moving slow you know, mm -hmm. you know um laban's come with his with his sons and his brothers and whoever these guys are probably like kind of like the pharaoh chase oh yeah we, we we caught you like in two days this was easy you guys are you guys are a whole army of people walking slow as all get out through these little valleys. We're coming right. full speed on a horse. 
So, you know, of course he's going to catch him. And it kind of even tells you a little bit more behind the story of, I never meant this for good. If I'm chasing you, does that sound like a good thing? If I'm trying to catch you, you know, it's not like, yeah. oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. You left your umbrella. Here you go. <laughs> you know, he's like, no, no, no. Where are you escaping? Why did you run? Why? You know, he he never said any nice words. And to Joe's point, there was a lot of nice pleasantries being passed around. Of, I just wanted to kiss my daughters and I wanted to hug my grandkids. At the same time, why are you gone? And uh, when are you coming back? And uh, how fast can we uh, fix this? Because uh, I'm not angry yet, but I will be if you say no. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. Uh, also earlier, that's, that's a Deuteronomy 15, uh, verse 17, Jonathan. Okay, thank and you. And this is about after the seventh, if I'm reading this correctly, it says it's about uh, when someone has served someone for seven years that there's a release. Mm-hmm. And but if they choose to stay, they have right. the opportunity to stay. But he says, "Hey, I love you. I don't want to leave." Then that's when the awe is placed through the ear. Mm-hmm. So apparently, with Jacob, he's like, "Hey, I didn't serve you." Matter of fact, I think that's why he says, "I didn't serve you twice." Mm-hmm. Uh, more than what the a lot of time is for. I've, I've actually served you. I think uh, maybe it's a total of twenty-one years. Once we get to this point, possibly. And so I've already served you for all of it. So this is where you need to release me. I don't, I don't want to stay here. I don't want to all through my ear. I don't want, you know, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, that's what it's saying here in Deuteronomy 15. Uh, I'll just read it real quick. It says, and you shall take an all and put it through his ear into the door and he shall be your slave forever. And again, like we said earlier, it's not the same as how we view slavery or the slavery is taking place here in the United States. But it says, because he loves you and your household, since he is well off with you, then you shall take an all and put it through his ear into the door, and it shall be your slave forever. And to your female slave, you shall do the same. So it was the same scenario, whether you were male or female. It didn't matter. Mm-hmm. So, hey, seven years you've served your time. You, you're free to leave. But if you love it here, you want to stay, hey, come into the family permanently. You know? Right. So, so that's why I said it kind of made it sound like, especially because of the forever part, kind of made it sound like, you know, maybe Laban had a little bit of a, a little bit of something correct to back up what he was saying. Hey, you're supposed to be here. You signed up. You you said yeah. you did your seven years and now you said you're staying. You're supposed to stay. Why are you leaving? Yeah. Well, you know, the other thing too, I want to say real quick is the whole thing is that he was looking for, you know, the whole thing with the idols. And we know that through the Genesis account, we know that Rachel took the idols. Mm-hmm. And so we're under, my understanding is this, Rachel didn't take the idols because she was serving other gods on the side, you know, along with, you know, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. What it, what I believe it was is that when we talked about divination and we talked about, you know, being able to see things, uh, you know, and so I think what she did was she took that out of fear of if I leave these with my father through divination, he will find out where we are. Yeah. It's the same, it's kind of the same thing with Joseph with his brothers, but we know that Joseph truly didn't mean that. He says, Hey, this is my cup of divination. You know, this, this why'd you take this? Blah blah blah. And so, um, but Joseph was more of he had a different agenda, you know, leading up to everything else. Mm-hmm. But here with Laban, I think that's why his daughter took them. She's like, I she she was ready to go, everybody was probably ready to go. She's like, I don't want to leave any chance at all that dad's gonna be able to find us. And so I think that's why she ended up taking him. But of course, we know through the story, Jacob's like, hey, if you know, let it be basically put a death curse curse on his wife and didn't realize it, you know, that anybody he's like, hey, nobody in our camp took anything. Hey, search <laughs> everything, go for it. Yeah. You know, of course, she was sitting on them and she said, Hey, I'm on my time of the month. So kind of, you know, you don't you don't need to be coming near me. Hey, daughter, hey, cool. <laughs> you know, so anyway, for those who know the story, you know where I'm going with that. But I just kind of want to bring that up too, because that's why those were with them more likely was she did. She was like, Hey, don't want him. We don't need dad find us. We need to get as far away as possible. Mm -hmm. And I think what we, what we see here is, you know, there's, there's a major concept that's flowing through this section, at least, you know, when we see the fruit of the spirit all over Jacob and, and, and the family, even, even um, with the different wives there, there's so much of this that's going on. That's, out of their comfort zone that's out of their desire right jacob mm-hmm. never desired four wives he never desired 15 20 30 years he, you know these these weren't things that were in his immediate plan they were in god's plan and it's and even if it wasn't in god's original plan god was like because of the scenario that you've been put in because of the place that you're in now 
this is how mm-hmm. we're going to walk through this. This is how we're going to work through this. And, you know, sometimes it's not for God's plan to be enacted. It's for our good. And, you know, we don't always recognize that God's putting his hand on us and he's kind of walking us through certain scenarios. So we benefit. We feel like we're losing. We feel like we're failing. We feel like we're struggling through these things. You know, again, four wives, all these kids and trying to work in the fields. This isn't this isn't sounding fun anymore. You know, I'm sure Jacob, you know, had the proverbial (laughs) cigarette at night one night was just like, God, what is going on? But at the same time, it was more of the you're in control. You never see through the story, at least where Jacob's like, I'm rebelling against God. I'm going to, you know, go and skip rocks until, you know, my brain gets in a better place. Like, okay, Hey, this is what we're doing. This is what we're doing. And in the Genesis account, we definitely get a little bit more of that connection. So what I see here is I've seen the fruit of the spirit all over it. We see, uh, patience. Wow. Ta- patience. Yeah. Hey, how much longer do I have to wait? I'll wait. I'll do that. And we did a video on patience. If you guys haven't watched it, go back and check that one out. It's an awesome video. I love Mm -hmm. patience. You know, it's one of those ones where do we pray about it? Is it forbidden? No, (laughs) of course not. But it's something that never pray for it. (laughs) Never. (laughs) And it was something that was walked out where we we, we could see it literally walked out here. And and I love that aspect of it. So what what are we what are we to do when we read this? We see that what's in God's plan. Does God choose to open and close the womb? Of course. Do we always have children? Do we always have success? Do we always have money on our time and our terms? Almost never, right? And, and, and that's to our benefit. We, we think we have the right answer and God's like, but I know better. My plans aren't your plans and be thankful that my plans aren't your plans because my plans for you are for good. My plans for you are for yeah. success. My plans for you are to love my son and myself for eternity in the new Jerusalem, the new kingdom, so we can spend forever together. So I just uh, really look at reading through this, understanding so much more of who Jacob was, the stuff he had to go through, and why we call these guys patriarchs, why we still look up to the men called Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Amen. Amen. And with that, we will see you next time for Chapter 29 in the Book of Jubilees. God bless. Shalom. Shalom.